Okay, great. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I am Nicole Quaid. I work with the Iowa Mentoring Partnership. Um, our introduction and icebreaker today. Um, one thing that you love about springtime that has not been canceled about COVID night by COVID-19. So if you were gonna say baseball or something else, you'll have to think of um, something that will not be affected or canceled. Uh, mine is going to be um, the smell of freshly cut grass is one of my favorite things about springtime. And we'll just go down the list here. So Anna, are you able to share? Yep. Um, Anna Sunstrom from Everybody Wins Iowa. Um, I, I, I'm still enjoying going for walks outside. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. And Bailey. Hi, I am Bailey Cosmore from Mills County Public Health. I apologize, I have like a cold going on or something right now. Um, but one of my favorite things about springtime is uh, my husband and I go outside and we play wiffle ball. That's one of my favorite things. Awesome, thanks for sharing, Bailey. Carla. Um, sitting on my deck. Um, we have a south facing deck and so uh, most of the summer it's pretty hot so spring is the awesome thing to do is sit on my deck when it's just the perfect time great yes thanks Carla uh, Colleen hi um, I'm Colleen with the youth mentoring program at Healthy Services and my thing that I love about spring is just getting outside and doing yard work and prepping it for planting and I also love the smell of fresh cut grass that's what I was going to say and you stole it Nicole so I'm saying it too. Awesome. Thanks, Colleen. I hope you can get out there working very soon. It's super windy today in Des Moines. I don't know if it's like that all over the state. But. It snowed here in Dakota just a little bit ago, and now the sun's back out. So who knows? Oh, no. We don't want any of that anymore. Okay, uh, Corey. See if I'm gonna check the okay. Corey says his um mic is not working. If you Corey, if you want to type in the chat box. One thing you like about spring. And in the meantime, oh yes, walking outside, just not today. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for joining us today. Uh Jamie. Hi, this is Jamie uh, Miller West from New Opportunities Mentoring Programs. Um, one thing I really enjoy about spring is just the weather getting nice and being able to play outside with my kids. Um, we've been having a pretty good time with bubbles and sidewalk talk lately. So that's, that's really fun too, and I really enjoy that. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Kathy. Kathy Schwartzoff from Youth Mentoring and Helping Services. and I love the flowers, like the daffodils and the hyacinths and the um, crocuses. Um, that spring color is just welcome after bleakness. <laughs> Very much agree. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Uh, Kristen. Kristen Langle with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Sioux Land. Um, with the springtime, I'm enjoying being outside and having the windows open, getting that fresh air in the house. Absolutely. Thanks, Kristen. Laura. Hi, um, my name is Laura and I'm the intern with Helping Services Youth Mentoring. And um, I really love going hammocking with my friends and just reading. And so I'm looking forward to um, doing that. Well, now I have to do it by myself because I can't meet my friends. <laughs> Yeah, do you have a good spot where you live to do that? 
I do. Um, when I'm not in Decorah, I live in Minneapolis. And so we have a lot of nice uh, trees next to the lakes where I live. Oh, great. That sounds lovely. Thanks for joining us, Laura. Uh, Lynn. Yes, Lynn Carroll, Heart of Iowa, Big Brothers, Big Sisters in Marshall County. Um, I would say I really just appreciate walking out the door at the end of the day from the office and the sun is still out. You know, the days the daylight is longer and it's like almost eight o'clock here now when when it's starting to turn dark. It's like I just feel like I just have more energy that way. Yes, that's another great thing to appreciate. Uh, Marissa. Hello, everyone. Um, someone earlier took mine, but I was going to say also that I love opening my windows, going on long drives, and going on walks with my family. And I um, am from Mentor, Nebraska. So I'm super thrilled to be a part of this conversation today and um, just hope we can have some great conversation later. Great, thank you so much for joining us today, Marissa. We're happy to have our Nebraska neighbor with us. And Mary. Hi everybody, Mary Shaka with Iowa Mentoring Partnership. I love to see the perennials start popping up and see these little green things sprouting up all over in my beds, the ones that the deer haven't gotten to already at least. <laughs> Great, thanks Mary. Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Caballero um, from Kinship of Martin County, um, Minnesota. I enjoy going outside and prepping our yard and getting things ready for gardening. Um, I've started a lot of different plants going, so I can't wait to put them in the ground. Great, thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Sarah. And it looks like Tanya has just joined us. We were just going around sharing one thing that we love about springtime that cannot be canceled by COVID-19. Tanya, if you're able to unmute yourself, you can share or you can type in the chat box. Um, yeah, actually, the one thing I like about spring and summer that I don't think they can cancel is riding my motorcycle or going out for a walk. Awesome. Let's see, I think we might have had a couple more join us. Um, looks like Dan Johnson joined us. Hey, Dan. Hi, Dan, if you want to share one thing that you love about springtime. And what program you're from. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can now. Thanks. Awesome. Um, one thing about springtime, you said? Yes, that cannot be canceled by quarantining. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. So you can play baseball because that's been canceled. <laughs> a lot of things. No, um, I actually do a lot of uh, like carpentry work. So uh, when I'm not building the program, I'm actually building like right now i'm building uh, a deck on my house so i'm finishing up some stairs and stuff like that so i actually like the uh crazy crazy I, I like the smell of cut wood and i like hammering and nailing and building things awesome um, thanks so much for sharing and then i'm with children of promise mentoring program in cedar rapids iowa i work to help kids through mentoring and helping kids who have incarcerated parents great Thanks, Dan, glad you could join us. Is there anybody else that I missed? This is Angie Woodford. I don't know if I would, if you guys tried to get in and I just was having computer issues. Um, I'm from the Storm Lake Stars Mentoring Program and I have a lot of the things have already been said that I enjoy, but obviously the weather, and I too also like leaving the office when it's still light, which doesn't happen usually. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today to continue um, 
learning and developing professionally. Um, everyone's springtime, um, things that they appreciate um, has put a big smile on my face. So thank you everyone um, for sharing. Um, we are, today we invited um, Marissa from Mentor Nebraska to join us. Um, she, um, presented at the um, Iowa Nonprofit Summit. And her session was um, very well attended and everyone um, was, was wanting some more information. Um, and we, so we've decided to um, invite her back and she, um, we're very happy that she's able to be here with us today and to share some more information on the topic of um, recruiting and um, recruiting diverse mentors and volunteers in our program. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Marissa. Awesome. I will say, can everyone hear me pretty well? Do you hear me well, Nicole? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, great. I will say on my screen on this end, I can't see everything on the screen. And I just wonder if that's going to impact the other slides, but we can just figure that out as we go. Like I can see recruiting diverse mentors and volunteers. Okay. Um, okay, so you do see the first slide, the recruiting. Right now I see um, all the slides to the left. Like you don't have it on the slide still, right? Um, give me one second. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. We'll just, we'll just figure it out. It might not make a difference as we move forward. If you don't mind, we can try the next slide. Yep. Okay. It might impact a little bit, but we'll figure it out. Um, but hello everyone. My name is Marissa Casillas. I am the training and program manager for Mentor Nebraska. As was mentioned, um, I had the pleasure of doing a breakout session on this topic um, a few months ago, and I really enjoyed um, meeting different people throughout the state of Iowa. We had great discussion. So um, if you were part of that conversation, this might be a refresher. Um, if you weren't a part of that conversation that we had during the breakout session, then um, I hope we can at least drop some nuggets um, that just has you ponder and think of diversity a little bit differently. And I hope that we can have some great discussion and dialogue as well. And so if you're not familiar with Mentor Nebraska, we are an affiliate of our national partnership, um, which is Mentor Partnership in Boston. And um, essentially we're here to be somewhat of a backbone agency for mentoring programs here throughout the state of Nebraska. So we don't do direct service, but we do um, the support. So technical assistance, training, and then we also push new initiatives um, such as youth initiated mentoring, which is a program that supports juvenile justice youth. So that's just a little brief introduction of who Mentor Nebraska is, and we can move forward to the next slide. Now, as I'm speaking, if there, there might be some questions that I do want you to kind of um, shout out to me or anything like that. So feel free to like unmute yourself or anything like that um, as we move forward, because I'm a very interactive um, presenter. So it's going to be hard, like not being able to see faces and talk. And I don't, I don't want to just talk at you. That's boring as well. So if there's any questions that I ask, please feel free to unmute yourself and kind of yell at me and I won't take offense to it. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Hello? Okay, well, hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, so, sorry, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So the first thing I want us to kind of dive into before we go into diversity is kind of unpacking a little bit of what culture means. And so when you look at this little culture wheel, there's different things that essentially make up culture. There's language, there's knowledge and stories, um, community connections, values, of course, of course, food, drink, and music. Those are the things that people typically go to. 
and also um, traditions and rituals. And so when we look through just some of these things, such as culture, I want you to also think about the organizations that you work for and the culture that's established in your workplace. And so one of the things I want you to think about before we move to the next slide is like when you first joined your organization or um, became first familiar with who you work for, um, and then some of you have been there probably for a long time now, I want you to kind of think about like words that you would describe the culture of your organization. So for example, some people might say um, punctual, like being punctual, like everyone in our organization is very timely, um, very precise in their work. Some people might say warm, welcoming, like there's different words that might come to mind when you think of culture and specifically your workplace culture. And before we move to the next slide, the biggest thing to think about when it comes to culture and how it connects to diversity is its symbolic communication. And I think it's really important to consider this um, as we uh, discuss diversity, diversity further because culture also is directly connected with diversity. And so we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different organizations. We all are youth centered, but we have our own special recipe that makes us unique in our approaches and makes us unique in our audiences, the youth that we're serving. And so these same things can be applied to um, culture and workplace culture. So would you mind moving to the next slide? So now, if you don't mind, um, would be a time just for you to unmute yourself if you don't mind kind of yelling out to me um, different words that describe your the culture of your organization. Team atmosphere. Please rise for our national anthem. Hello? Just go ahead and go ahead and start um, yelling it out. I keep hearing, please rise for the national anthem. <laughs> I'm like, am I being disobedient? I'm not standing for the national anthem. Um, also, let me see. Some of you might be writing in the chat box. But yeah, would you mind um, just shouting out one word that you would use to describe the culture of your organization, where you work? Team atmosphere. Team Patient. atmosphere. That's great. Patient. Patient. Collaborative. Family friendly. Awesome. Anyone else willing to take the risk of yelling something out at me? Uh oh, non okay, non judgmental. I see that in the chat box. Accepting. If there's um, typos in what I've written in the chat box, sorry, I was trying to do it fast. <laughs> Welcoming. Anyone else? Okay, well, just looking at some of the words that have already been mentioned, like welcoming, non judgmental, accepting, family, friendly oriented, like you're one big family, collaborative, patient, supportive, um, a team atmosphere. All of those are great things. Um, but some of us might not be that eager to share because guess what? There's also a um, culture that may not be the most um, positive always, you know? And, and truthfully, in any organization, there's pros and cons to how we operate. There's pros and cons even to the culture. And so, like, there, sometimes people say the culture at their organization is micromanagement and they feel that they can't breathe or they don't have grace to make mistakes or, you know, so I'm really grateful that there were really great positive things that we were able to consider. But one of the things that I want you to think about a little bit deeper is you, okay, so we described, oh, safety, a place of safe, welcoming. Okay, great, great feedback. So when we're, when we're discussing 
those three words or one word or two words or whatever words come to mind about our workplace culture, essentially that's also what we want those who are experiencing our services to experience as well, right? So, so if you have, um, if everybody on your team speaks the same language, like this is who we are, this is our blueprint, um, this is our fingerprint in this world. I want to make sure that everyone in this organization represents us in such a way, you know, then these are the same things that you would want to be described about who you are. So if you experience feeling welcomed or a team oriented environment or whatever the words are that come to mind when you're describing your workplace atmosphere, then that's what you essentially, like I said, would want others to describe it as well. And so something that I also encourage um, the different partner programs that we work with from time to time is doing temperature checks. That's what I call it, temperature checks, just to kind of figure out, okay, this is what we're wanting to project to the outside world or those who we're serving, but what are they experiencing? And sometimes just by sending out a survey like that, can really give you perspective and things to think about. Like, okay, this is what's really passionate to us, but if is this what's really being communicated to who we're serving? So before I worked for Mentor Nebraska, um, I was an educator. I taught high school um, language arts for an alternative high school here in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, doing temperature checks is what I call them. <laughs> is something that I did very intentionally with my students, whether it was temperature checks as like as far as how they were experiencing their learning environment or even just temperature checks like how are you doing today? For those who said it's like a safe place and they feel safety when I walk in there when they walk into work, I bet you there's a relational aspect of the culture of your organization. You might have leadership that takes time to really get to know you and to hear you and you feel safe. So that's important too. Um, would you mind moving to the next slide? So when you think about those three different words, um, they impact and influence these different brackets, right? So for example, let's look at accepting. So this, the culture in your organization, if it's accepting, will impact all these different areas. So if you feel accepted, or on the flip side, if you don't feel accepted, it's going to impact and influence how you communicate, how you express yourself, right? So if you feel like you work in an environment where you're not seen, you're not heard, your voice isn't really taken into consideration, nor your perspective, how you communicate is going to be impacted. If you feel accepted, how you build relationships in that organization and where you work, it's going to be impacted. Who is drawn to your organization? So if you have an environment where it's non-judgmental or it is judgmental, then we've got to realize that that's going to impact and influence who is drawn in and who shows up not just who we're serving, but also our volunteers. So that's also something to think about. Self-expression ex, um, and acceptance. Are you able to be your authentic self in your workplace? Or do you feel that you have to dim your light just to be safe you know, to exist in that place? Or if you feel safe and secure, are you able to bring your authentic self? Like all those things are important. And all of these things directly impact diversity and who's showing up for your organization as well. And so a lot of times um, when people bring up diversity, they want to, oh, I want to impact my, um, our policies and our procedures and, and um, make sure that who the youth that we're serving, um, there's mentors that look like them. And all of that is great, right? But if there is not a foundational core aspect of your organization that values diversity, then it's going to be a very surface level of diversity, truthfully. It's going to be surface or it's going to be non-existent. So as we're just um, talking about these things, I want you to always have in the back of your mind, how does diversity relate to this content? And so the last two um, areas that, excuse me, this impacts, 
is the actions you take and the actions you don't take. So if you work in an environment, like I said earlier, where let's say you have management that are micromanagers, right? It's going to impact the risks that you take. Are you gonna step forward and make suggestions or are you gonna keep quiet because you feel like you have no room to breathe and to be able to grow and make mistakes and suggestions and be heard? Or if you have a phenomenal manager who let, let, gives you grace to make mistakes and, and allows you to be your authentic self, think about um, how you're able to take steps and do things that bring you joy. And then the last, the last um, circle is what else? So I know that we have, we don't have a lot of time to really dissect that, but think like what are other areas that your workplace culture is directly impacting you and then trickling down to others? And so a lot of times people don't really, really, really put a lot of emphasis and intention and thinking about like, who are we? Like, what are we really doing? What are we communicating? And how are those experiencing us that we're serving? And how are those experiencing us that are our volunteers? Because that can impact, like I said earlier, who's drawn in, but also who remains. The biggest advocates that we have um, in this field are our volunteers. And if we don't have diverse volunteers, then we're not going to have spokespers like spokespeople in our communities that are speaking on our um, behalf and bringing in diversity as well. One of our top researchers, his name is Mike Gunger, he talked about how, and this is probably not going to be any surprise to anyone on the on the um, line right now, that 78% of those who become mentors, and we can even put volunteers in there because mentors are volunteering their time and their their efforts. 78% of them are brought to ment the mentoring field by someone inviting them that's a friend or family member. And so if we don't have those who are experiencing us very well, that are of diverse backgrounds and experiences and cultures, then there's no surprise that maybe our pool of volunteers continue to remain the same or um, look the same all the time. So these are just some things I'd like you to consider as we move forward. Would you mind going to the next slide? <clears throat> so the waterline of visibility. Um, would anyone be willing to kind of share with me as you're looking through the different words on this iceberg, would anyone be willing to share with me what they notice about the words at the very top and what they notice about the words at the bottom? This is Kathy, and I notice at the top that things could be more visible, but not necessarily um, to everybody. And then the lower things are more things that you would have to get to know the person or the culture more deeply to understand their concepts and everything. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else want to um, kind of describe what they notice? <laughs> Jamie said, yeah, what she said. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, um, this is Dan Johnson. Um, one of the things that uh, I notice, um, I work with kids who have incarcerated parents. And so mm -hmm. the first thing that people see is the, the skin color, race, and age, and then they ask, so what their parents do. Mm -hmm. and, and then that makes them make a decision whether or not they're going to be a mentor or not. But most people who don't ask those questions end up finding out the things that are below the, the, the waterline. We miss a lot of mentors because they, or we, or we benefit, we benefit by those mentors not joining us or potential people ment joining us because they do notice those things. We don't want them to notice those things. But, you know, when you talk about kids who have incarcerated parents, people are turned off. So, yeah. Or youth that, thank you so much for sharing that, or even youth that have been um, 
locked up themselves, you know, in detention centers and juvenile justice, or some of them call the youth delinquents. And, you know, there's so many different language and the messages that impact not just the youth that we serve, but also who sees themselves as being worthy mentors or not. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Um, but also, I'm really glad you guys, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You know, the top part is like things that would seemingly see like what you can see when you first look at someone, right? And not necessarily, especially with like gender and race and, and skin color and nationality. But as you go further, you, you don't know someone's thinking style or their learning styles or their life experiences. We can make assumptions. We have, we carry our own biases, but we really don't truly know the things that lie beyond the surface. And as you notice, the tip of the iceberg is a lot smaller than the depths of the, the iceberg that's under the water. And that's who we're really made up of. And so those same things apply to um, our organization. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, I went to a conference where I did a breakout session on this as well. They wanted me to speak about diversity and how to bring in diverse volunteers. And one of the things I told them is, you know, um, me being a black woman, whenever I go into different spaces, I will subconsciously look around the room when I walk into a space and see if there's any other black people. And if I do see another black person, it brings me a little bit of like, okay, I'm not the only one. And this particular conference that I shared that with, there were probably about 300 different people at this conference. And out of the 300 people, I was like, and I know there's six black people here today, four of which are breakout session presenters. <laughs> and so some people, when I shared that, they were like, number one, blown away. Like, wow, there's only six black people here and four of them aren't even, they don't work for our company. They actually are here presenting. And then others were kind of surprised because they, they didn't have to think about that, right? They didn't have to think about, oh, is there another white person here? Because everyone else was. And so when someone is walking into your organization, are they only seeing a particular demographic in your staff? Are they only seeing a particular racial group in your senior leadership? What does your board look like? Because truthfully, we can have these conversations about um, diversity and how we get more diverse volunteers. But if people don't see themselves, there's truly power and representation. If they don't see themselves, they're not going to feel safe to be themselves when they walk into your organization. Would you mind going to the next slide? And so, um, before we dive into this next part, which is interchangeable and makes sense with what we're talking about, I really do want to want you to think about that. Um, all of you are from different organizations. All of us here have different levels of authority based on what our positions are, based on, um, yeah, what type of role we have also. But I, but I truly want to say, if there's not diversity at every level, of your organization are all vo our voices really being heard how the decisions are made who are they impacting the most um, is someone able to share a perspective from a different you know way of living or life experiences that may challenge the majority or whatever it is like it can't just be the surface level of valuing diversity if we need more diverse volunteers I just want to say, if that's something that you're passionate about, it's got to be much bigger than that. Um, so I feel like I'm rushing because, I mean, really, we could spend hours upon hours on this conversation, but it makes me want to move on to this next part about our language and our messaging. And that truly, truly, truly matters as well. Um, I believe, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Was it Dan earlier you were sharing about? the youth that you're serving and how people, they'll um, in their position of privilege be, oh, so what do your parents do? And just by that question, it's putting the youth in a box, right? Just in that question, there can be so much unpacked bias that comes up from that, you know? And 
And that comes up in so many different ways, specifically, like I said, our language and our messaging. So I wanna back up a little bit. Um, during the summer last year, um, a group of me and my colleagues, five of our different program partners here in Omaha, we were on our way back from a conference and we were talking about the subject matter, diversity. And we were sharing about how we describe our youth and how, how we have conversations with our youth impacts who comes to our um, organizations. So some of the things we were saying were kind of like, oh, we say troubled or at risk youth. Um, and, and how that right there eliminates some people from being like, oh, I do not want to work with kids like that. So they're completely uninterested in coming, right? But then we took it a step deeper and we're like, well, what if it's an adult that has a past, right? Like, are we saying because they have made mistakes in their past um, that they're not worthy of being mentors? When we say at risk, there might be like, well, shoot, I might be considered at risk too. If, if that's how you're describing your youth and if that's how you're describing your youth, I'm not gonna step up to be a mentor. And research shows us that sometimes some of the most effective mentors are those who have made significant mistakes. Of course, we still want our youth to be safe, but we also want our youth to have the most compatible um, volunteers who can really help them navigate real life issues that they're going through. And those who have walked through those same shoes are some of the most qualified individuals. And so I want you to think about excuse me, think about some of your marketing materials. If, if your marketing materials have um, older, and this is something that I have looked into, like an older white man with a business suit on, and he's got a delinquent Latino young boy, and that's what a lot of your marketing materials show, then it's going to be no surprise if you get a lot of middle-aged white men that are wealthy and professionals that come and and you don't see a lot of anyone else coming. So, you know, how we speak, what messages we put out on social media, what messages we put out to um, our uh, funders and to the community when we're talking about our youth, all of those things also matter. So when you think about the organizational structure of your organization, from your board, to your senior leadership, to your entry level workers, to you know, management, entry level, volunteers. If there isn't a diversity, um, isn't diverse voices speaking to that, then I'm, it's going to be really hard to bring those in. I also have some people who say, well, I live in a rural area. We don't live in a very diverse community. I hear that often. Um, would you go to the next slide? Um, I do hear that often. Oh, and you can go to the next one, sorry. Um, but what I would like to say is diversity encompasses so much, right? Like a lot of times people go to that tip of the iceberg for diversity. Oh, um, you know, race, ethnicity, um, language, all of those things. But truthfully, diversity isn't just those things. If you look at your organizational structure and it's all women, well, then maybe you need to have male perspective, right? If you look at your pool of volunteers and it's all older, you know, 70 plus men and women, well, then you need to have an action plan and some strategic steps that you can take to engage with younger people. And so diversity doesn't have to just be a, a race thing or a language thing or, um, whether they're, you know, um, immigrants or refugees or all those things, of course, impact and influence diversity, but it's not the only thing. So when you look at this sheet, there's just some really practical steps that apparently says one, 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 <laughs> but they should be listed one, two, three, four, five. The first thing that you could do is identify some of the greatest needs within your community. So if you look at your town, your city, wherever you live, you may be able to identify there is um, significant absenteeism. So say you look at the data and it's like, oh, a lot of our youth 
are either tardy for school or not going. So that's one of the things, but there might be a whole pool of them, right? That you come up with poverty, absenteeism, LGBTQ plus, uh, we could go on and on. But one of the things you would want to do is say, okay, what is one aspect of diversity we want to, we want to address? So then you would just choose one of those things, right? So like this year, we're just going to focus on the absenteeism issue, like making sure that we are getting our youth in school, right? Rather than looking at this huge, this huge, huge, huge category, the categories of diversity, because some of us can be so overwhelmed, just choose one. The next step would be become an expert, engage with different community partners, um, educate yourself, bring in consultants that are really educated in that area that can really help you with um, your approach and your strategies to meet that need or to engage with that community. So one of the things right now that we're wanting to focus on is really suppress, um, supporting refugee populations different um, better here in Omaha. We have a lot of refugees from all over the world. And a lot of times their different communities are not very trusting. So we're like, we've got to educate ourselves better so that we can build trust and help support them and give them resources. But we're, you know, we may not be able to speak the language or understand their culture. And so it's important for us to engage with other community partners that are more familiar with it so that we can make sure that our services are actually addressing the needs rather than us thinking it's addressing the need. And then lastly, after you do those things, then create a space for those people that you've engaged with that are the experts to actually have a voice to impact and influence your policies you have in place so that you're able to support them as well. So for example, um, we were able to um, change some of our guidelines around our background checks, right? So our youth are still, it's still our primary focus to make sure our youth are safe, but we also were able to provide um, different surveys and receive feedback to hear that some of the policies on our background checks were eliminating people that didn't need to be eliminated. So by us creating a space for different people to have voices, we were, we were able to make adjustments in our background checks, which opened up the door for other people to be able to mentor. So that's what I mean when I say um, giving people a voice to impact and influence our policies, because sometimes we have restrictions in place that we're blindsided by. We don't even realize it's in a restriction until we give someone else permission and a different voice to speak to those things. Would you mind going to the next slide? So I hit on this just a little bit, um, you know, already, but, you know, when you look at this umbrella of diversity, you see ethnicity, culture, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, language. I mean, we could go on and on because diversity is an umbrella term. And so as mentioned a little bit before, it can be overwhelming to be like, okay, I actually don't know much about <laughs> diversity, right? I would say um, I'm someone that's really, really passionate about DEI work, but I still don't know everything. I'm still learning and growing. And if I ever say I know everything, that I know nothing at all because our world is so great and beautiful and full of diversity. And so I would say, um, just as I mentioned before, do not get overwhelmed with this. I know this conversation is really brief, just have cultural humility. And that's just being quick to listen and slow to speak and really wanting to learn and engage with different people that think differently and look differently than you and, and create safe spaces for them to share and to be themselves. And when we're able to be positioned with that humility, then we're able to really impact systemic change and to really bring and draw people of rich diversity to our organizations. And so um, before I move forward, does anyone have anything that they would like to, that any aha moments you've had or anything, um, any questions about anything we've discussed so far? Because I realize I'm just talking. 
but I did want to at least create space before we get to the very end. Um, if anyone has anything they're just sitting on. Okay, would you mind going to the next slide? Oh, well, that's all folks. So long, just to kind of summarize everything, um, I think it's amazing that this is a conversation that so many people throughout the country are beginning to have. Um, just in January, we were at the National Mentoring Summit in um, Washington, D.C. Some of you may have been there. And for those who are part of affiliates, a day and a half of that summit, we had um, a concept called Open Spaces, which created an opportunity for us to collectively come together and share about needs we have and then allow us to also be the ones that brainstorm and collectively problem solve. And so one of the breakout sessions had to do with racial equity and representation. And from that conversation, we ended up deciding to have a national diversity, equity and inclusion committee. And so um, this conversation around diversity and bringing different volunteers and different mentors of different backgrounds and um, different life experiences is something that so many people are not only discussing, but really trying to problem solve and create spaces for people to thrive and be their authentic selves. And so I'm a part of that committee and um, Mentor Nebraska, we actually have our own diversity task force um, that we started in September, where we meet every month to discuss recruitment strategies and organizational structure strategies. So like talking about, okay, who has the power to make decisions in your organization? What does it look like from the top of your organization all the way to, you know, um, the worker, you know, the workers of your organization? Um, who, who has a voice? Who is represented? Who, you know, just so many different aspects of diversity, equity, inclusion, truly have to be dissected and dealt with. And so, um, this is something that I'm very passionate about, but people all throughout the country and, and truthfully, we just all need one another. You know, we not, none of us have all of the answers, but if this is something that you are passionate about and you would like to, um, engage with even more, um, as we continue this work on the national level with DEI, um, work, I'll make sure that I still stay connected with Nicole and, um, push resources your way as well. So I saw a comment that just popped up. Um, sorry, there's a lot of comments. But anyways, um, now I would like to, if it's okay with Nicole, because it's 2.49, um, I'd like to open it up. If there's any questions that anyone has or, or concerns or feedback or anything, um, if it's okay with you, Nicole, um, we could open it up, or if you have any particular order that you like to do things, I can follow your lead now. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. And yeah, the last comment that um, came in was from um, Laura, and she said, I like the inclusion of being aware of the different aspects of your identity and recognizing the gaps where you might not know everything, always being open uh to learning more yeah I was for sure gonna say um when you were talking about having the um humility to know um you know what you don't know and to make partnerships and bridges to other organizations in your community that might um have more um, knowledge or experience working with different um populations and different um aspects of, the, of your community um, I thought that that was a very helpful um, suggestion. Awesome. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. Is yeah, so with the oh. chat box is open and you please um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, and join in the conversation with any questions, thoughts, comments.
This is Mary. Marissa, I appreciated you starting just with the broadly with the culture of your organization and and um we were like you said people make positive comments and creating that experience for our volunteers to come into the organization as well I and mean, we just starting with that basics before we look at um you know recruiting diverse populations as well looking at our own culture mm -hmm. awesome thank you yeah that's just really important i mean think about it even if we think about something like chick-fil-a right no matter where we go in America, and you go to Chick-fil-A, you like for me, I experience the same culture, right? Like hospitality, customer service is something they all value. And because no matter where you go, you experience it, experience that, then you know, you know that that's a core value to their organization, right? Because they're all so hospitable. And so even if we think of like, you know, organizational structures like that we should also have that experience for everyone we come in contact with and we're serving in our organization, you know? Is there anything else that people would like to chime into or even you share anything that stood out to you or that you would like to discuss further? We have about eight more minutes. I can follow your lead, Nicole. Yeah, yes. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat box right now. Um, okay. or hearing anyone else on the lines right now. So again, Marissa, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. And like you said, um, you know, just starting the conversation as this work is um, something that takes um, a lot more involvement from all of the organization and um, will definitely be a long-term thing. So thank you so much. Um, we do My have- My pleasure. Thank you. We have a couple um, other opportunities that we wanted to let people know of. If I can get my slide to go forward here. Um, so Volunteer Iowa, our innovation exchange that was initially going to be um, in person, um, they have postponed the in-person part um, indefinitely right now, but are going to have um, an online version of this training um, that is also a very similar um, focus with um, a discussion, start of a conversation about um, impact of equity and inclusion and in volunteering. Um, and it is part one, so there'll be more to come, um, but you can register. Um, the link that's on the slide right now um, was also shared in the IMP newsletter. So um, you can look to that for an easy link to click on to register. I believe the deadline to register is April 22nd. Um, so you probably want to do that sooner than later. And the webinar will be on April 28th um, from 10 to 11.30. And a couple other upcoming trainings. Um, these were all also in the IMP newsletter. Um, just a reminder that there are um, some great content in these upcoming trainings and webinars put on by um, different groups and organizations. I know in our last um, check-in call that we had on Monday, um, we did hear some voices of people um, that are looking for um, training and learning and professional development at this time. So please, we encourage you um, to check these out. Um, another reminder that the IDPH mentoring grant is due on April 21st, and Mary has um, encouraged um, if you want to run ideas um, by or have questions um, that she has offered to help um, and have a conversation with you on that topic. So you can take her up on that offer. Um, and then our next peer share call will be in May. Uh, Mary, is there anything else coming up that I've missed that you can think of?
Okay, great. Well, again, Marissa, thank you so much. And thank you for graciously putting your contact information out and having that offer um, to the, continue the conversation individually if, if any of the participants would like to do so. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And everyone, take care and have a great rest of your day. And enjoy that springtime. <laughs> See you, everyone. Thank you.